Well, I'm conscious of time as always. Uh, so welcome everybody to uh, the May Founder Circle. Today we're joined by David Collier. He's a serial founder with three exits under his belt. He is jumping back into startup world with clear word. So David was one of the early investors in Intercom and Trustev. He's, we're delighted to have him join here today. He's going to share some lessons learned um, and some successes and failures and all that good jazz. For anyone that's new to the Founders Circle, um, this is the largest regular tech founder and networking event in Ireland. And it's a monthly event. Yeah, for it's tech culturally very different. different. It's a monthly event for tech founders to connect, to share experience and to get um, and share valuable insights from others on the, on the journey as we go from startup to scale up and we try and master that. So here's a space for honest, rich conversations among ourselves. What happens in the breakout room, please stays in the breakout room. They're private sessions, okay? Um, the Founder Circle is powered by ORDI Hub and Scale Ireland. I'm Radine O'Connor. I'm the community manager in ORDI Hub. Uh, we're home to NDRC in the Southwest, the AI Summer School, and ORDI Hub connects entrepreneurs and innovators to accelerate business growth. This was a big week for us because our first ever members, Taximo, who joined us last year when we opened, um, have been acquired by a US company, Vertex, for 200 million. So Taximo joined the RDI Hub when we opened our doors. They've been very much part of our journey. They came in as 15 people, and in the 18 months, they scaled to 50. That story, Taximo story, provides that inspiration to the companies in RDI Hub and the Southwest because that ecosystem that we're creating for innovation and fast growing companies provides a stimulating environment where you have success breeding success so there was much celebrations as you can imagine <laughs> it's kind of ongoing um but yeah so big day for taximo um, and delighted to be part of their journey founder circle is supported by rdi hub and scale ireland uh, scale ireland is a very important voice in Ireland. It's Ireland's independent policy voice for Ireland's innovation driven recovery. That's everybody here. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Niall and David to kick off the chat. Well, thank you very much, Raydeen. Um, such a, an exciting week, of course, for RDI Hub uh, with Taximo and that 200 million all cash deal. And welcome, David Collier, serial entrepreneur and investor. Um, so you're very welcome to the RDI Hub Founder Circle. And I'm Niall Larkin, as Radine has said, Program Manager here at RDI Hub. So let's dive straight in and have a look at those companies uh, mentioned by Radine. Quickdesk, Orchestra and Barricade.io. Quickdesk raising 20 million in just, or looked like raising 20 million in just four months after it was set up. Orchestra sold to engineered after just 18 months after it was set up. And Barricade.io raised 1.2 million after one year and sold one year after that. I think you'll all agree that is some track record of super fast value creation. And my question to David here is, you think you might slow down a small bit there? <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Because I always hear people talking about fast growth and all of that sort of stuff. And to me, it, it really comes down to obsessive, like obsessively fixing problems. <laughs> and the growth seems to come with it rather than trying to focus on it. And I, I, I don't know, I tried. I tried to retire. I lasted a hold of two weeks. Then that did not work. So no, I don't think I'm going to slow down or speed up even for that matter. I think my brain is just wired to become <laughs> obsessed about a problem and then trying to fix it. And no, I don't see it slowing down anytime soon, to be honest. In fact, now it's, it's going faster than ever. Very good. I've got a, a question here from uh, Kaylee Breen of uh, mm -hmm. Wedding Wizard. And she wanted to ask, um, how much actual traction did you have before you raised the 1.2 million for Barricade? Ah, that's a good question. None, actually, because 
I only raise seed on stories. And it took actually three weeks to raise 1.2 million for Barricade. And three weeks of actual fundraising, but probably two and a half months of putting a story together and figuring out what problem we were fixing and whose job we were <laughs> at the time thinking we were making better. Uh, it turns out we weren't making their jobs better. We were actually replacing the job of, of someone. So that, that was a bit of a mistake to, to be focusing on. So because you can't sell to someone if you're putting them out of a job. But yeah, it took about three weeks to raise 1.2. And then after that, we were raising a series A of 5.5 and that took forever. And we actually ended up selling in between during the, during the process of raising the series A. And so like, had you moved from like the story into uh, numbers, like when you're trying to raise, raise your series A, obviously that, that would be a requirement. What was happening? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I see this a lot now, right? So th this is questions that come into me quite often is, people ask the kind of traction, the kind of numbers you need for your seed, like what, what's your market fit, frankly. So there, there, there's a few ways, right? So some people don't need to raise, right? It's okay to have a lifestyle business. You don't need to sell for 200 million, even though it's, it's good for the founders. And if they reinvest in the ecosystem, it's even better for, for the environment, which I hope they will do if they're on the call. <laughs> um, but there's also, so, so raising the seed comes to, two things, right? Well, a few, more than two things, but we'll break it down into two things. Either you raise on, on, on this story. Mm -hmm. So the story is how you fix a problem. How big is that problem that you're fixing? And that's easy. Mm -hmm. For me, it's very easy to go on and, and tell a story of how we're going to fix something and how we built a product that fixes and addresses this problem. Then when you move to series A, you're, you're judged not on, on, on the story, but on the metrics. So at that point, you're supposed to have some sort of product market fit, not just a product fit, which is a huge difference, a very common mistake for, for, for founders. Uh, but selling on metrics is really hard because month, like uh, the fundraising process doesn't take three weeks usually. In the case of Barricade, it was unheard of basically that three weeks, all the money was in the accounts. It was unbelievable. And that's investors from Hong Kong, that's investors from the US, that's investors from Ireland. And they all just, they just wanted to be on board. But then when we started going into the metrics and we started raising Series A, what we realized is, okay, so the, let's say the fundraising process was like three months. The first month, our numbers are great. We're 120% growth this month. And the next month, we're at 80% growth, which is still unbelievable. But then the investors who were initially coming to join say, wait, wait, there was 120 last month. Now it's 80% growth. We're like, yeah, but I can look at it. It's 80% it's growth. It's still pretty good. And then the next month, if you're at 80, 82, they're like, well, that's not growing as fast. So the thing is when you're raising a seed, for instance, in the case of Barricade, I, I, I say, if you want to raise a seed, just, just go ahead and raise it as early as you can. Focus on your story, test your story and see how people respond to it. If you really have to raise on metrics, either you make the metrics say what you want them to say. So you pick the exact metrics that you want. So if your customer acquisition costs and your lifetime value are 3x, focus on that. Sell that story. And then, yeah, for the, for the series, for seed to series A, it's trying to tie that story that you have into your metrics if your metrics are not good enough. But yeah, we can, we can dig into any of those if you want. Oh, absolutely. Look, um, I think everybody is gagging to hear more about how to tell a good story, right? If you can tell a story to raise such, such an amount of money so quickly and you don't have to get into the messy uh, problem, problem, problem of uh, metrics there to yeah, well, tell it's, a story for you. It's not hard, to be honest. Telling a good story is very easy. Uh, first of all, you have to believe what you're actually selling. Okay. And if you just started a business because you wanted to have a business, like, you know, the, the startup lifestyle, or the company lifestyle, your story is probably not going to be great. So for, for me in particular, what I focus on is, uh, focus on is always the, the, the job, like how do we make one person more successful in the company? So let's say we, we target the security analyst, for instance. Yeah. We say, okay, how do we make the security analyst's jobs better? And from there, we start fixing, okay, what's their problem? So it's, it's kind of customer persona mixed with customer job stories but really making the whole deck around this and then showing that there's a market around it, like a, a total addressable market that's ridiculously big. So you go with anything. So I, I have had an advisor who said, three billion is too small for a total addressable market. 
So I try to find the largest possible market. Then I go to the, the, the lower under, which is the serviceable addressable market. Mm-hmm. And then eventually you go the obtainable market, so, which is more realistic. So you need to really identify the problem that you're solving. And that, that sounds very common for people to say, but if you do find one problem and you're really solving this correctly, and then this problem is big enough for enough people, you can make a story around this easily. It's, it's making a story of that person in the company. How does that resonate with them? And then you just talk to people in those positions and they will tell you their stories, which then you use in your story. Okay, so really good customer discovery, understand your persona. That's right. Explain to um, those who, who you wish to invest how you're gonna make a hero out of that individual. In their exactly, job. that's yeah. exactly it, yeah. Okay. Very cool, very cool. It's great to hear that from you. Um, Helen, um, was saying here, uh, like bar- barricade is able to warn businesses uh, when they're about to be hacked. So she wants to know what can be learned from the HSE ransomware attack. <laughs> oh God, that is a polarizing question. <laughs> uh, okay, so first of all, there's enough FUD in security. Uh, we say FUD for fear, uncertainty, and doubt mm-hmm. going around with the HSC attack until all the facts come out. I'm not going to try and and give what I think are my opinions on what happened. But frankly, security, it's just going to happen. Okay, from the HSE attack, what, like we've been saying this for years, it's not if, it's when, and when has it happened already? Because I always assume that we've already been hacked. Okay, Mm -hmm. so frankly, there's a lot of FUD going around about the HSE systems and about the HSE's security groups and everything that happened. Okay, first of all, ransomware is, is a business. If you take it as a business and you see it's, it's fully opportunistic in this case, I don't think it was state sponsored trying to undermine our position or whatever. In this case, my opinion is it was fully opportunistic. And frankly, DHSE did some audits. They are in, or they were in the process of upgrading some systems and going through some of the controls they have to do. And frankly, security is not a, a, a black or white. It's not a binary decision. It's an ongoing process. It's, 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 it's maturity that you go through it. Okay, now, I'll bring it to a binary question then. Should the ransom be paid? Absolutely not. Because I'll be honest, the data is already out there anyways. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if anyone great. believes that the data is not out there already, they're either lying to themselves or they're misinformed in this case. Of course, it's out there already. It's already being operationalized. There's already people getting calls on how the medical treatments are going to be done faster and sold to them. I got a call yesterday from some company trying to, I was like, no, 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 no. So the point is, the HSE is underfunded. The, the, the mm-hmm. office of the CIO in Ireland and the government is underfunded and understaffed. Like you can't pay security professionals 65 grand a year when they will just go over the pond and an early, like a, a junior security professional that's decent will land a job at 250 grand in any medium company at this point. The CIO in, in this country makes what, 89,000 like mm-hmm. announced? Yeah. Or anywhere else, you'll get a million a year immediately. Like CIOs are in huge demand for big companies. And like, frankly, we need to pay. And it's, this is critical infrastructure, our security. Like some people see military funding and it needs to be a big thing. Security is the same thing. It's vital to lives. And in the case of the HSE, look, there, there's, <laughs> there's just, they're just understaffed. And this country is, I'd rather focus on the positive. The country has a lot of really solid security professionals. A lot of them. Anyway, sorry, that's that's a very oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So you, you have a long term interest in security, right? Back to um, bring you back to when you were fifteen. Absolutely. A little bit about yeah. that. Your yeah. first business. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said before to you, I think in another call, I'm I'm very lazy by nature, which is why I think it makes my products usually decent. And when I was fifteen, is when I started really selling software when I realized I could sell a software to someone because I had built a piece of software that's when Wi-Fi networks were kind of coming out and I'd built uh, first of all a kernel driver for a Linux that would scan wireless networks faster then it would find wireless networks try to break their encryption keys which were bad back then then it would connect to those networks find computers in those networks and then break into those computers with one click so when Wi-Fi's were new I would park in front of IBM and click go and then I would be into IBM's network which was awesome and then just because I was lazy, initially this started because I forgot my password on my home Wi-Fi network. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, God, I wish I could just get into my network. Uh, it turns out I could. And then, yeah, then I sold that to university. And, and from there, security was kind of a, an interest. 
Okay. And then um, can you tell us a little bit about your, your business in Cuba? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, another thing that, <laughs> that I do with business is, uh, in fact, that's a huge fight I have with my, my, my dad, which doesn't understand this, is I don't work. Like all the businesses I've started, they're really things that I find fun to attack and to work on and to like, if I'm going to sacrifice a big part of my life and my time, it has to be fun. Okay. And I, I think that's a generational difference. My dad works from nine to five. That's his job. It's secure. And he loves this. When I tell him that I'm doing things for fun, he doesn't get that. So Cuba was the same thing. We're like, Oh, okay. So we, I was in Canada and then the U S had an embargo on Cuba. And we realized, okay, so if we buy medical devices, we can carry them over to Cuba. And once we're in Cuba, because we had a friend there, we knew someone in the Habana factory. We're like, okay, we can buy cigar boxes, bring them back into Canada, put them on eBay because you couldn't buy Cuban cigars in the US. We put them on eBay as uh, like we plaster our email everywhere on the, on, the, on the ad. eBay would take the ad off because it's you know, an embargoed product. People would email us, we would ship it as a gift. So we would bring the medical supplies, we would sell those ahead of time, which would pay for our flights, for our hotels, for our houses. Then we'd bring Cuban cigars once or twice a month, a few boxes, which we would sell for about $800 a box. And then we started doing this a few, a few times a month for a year, year and a half. And it was great. <laughs> it was great. It was just for fun. We got to travel. We got to experience Cuba from, uh, from not, not, the, not the hotel side, but also so the, the street and, and the people. And it was, it was amazing. And I only discovered that, that story myself and talking to David, I'm saying, well, he speaks uh, German and French and Irish and Latin and Spanish. I say, how did you learn Spanish? So, <laughs> 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 so listen, well, let's, let's move on to talk about uh, ClearWord. Um, can yep. you just explain to everybody what it is and like what problem it solves and your initial customers that you're targeting and why you've chosen yep. that? Absolutely. So what I'll start is I'll, I'll give the idea that, that the background from Sophos. So, so when we sold Barricade, we joined Sophos, which was a much, much bigger company. Uh, it's thousands of people. And immediately I had a team in India, a team in San Francisco, a team actually on the East Coast as well, and in Ireland. And it started becoming very daunting on me to, to stay awake at night, to be on every meeting and try to figure out what my teams are saying. Because as a director, my job was to make sure I, I had all the information from my teams to help them uh, overcome their problems. So again, with my extremely lazy or, yeah, let's go with my lazy nature, <laughs> I built a tiny piece of code that would fetch the recordings of their meetings overnight when they were having meetings, when I'm not there. It would transcribe the text, uh, run some topic modeling, so identify the topics that are discussed. And then in the morning, I would check what they talked about. And if I, could, if I saw two teams were talking about the same thing, but not talking together, I would reach out to them and say, okay, is there anything I can do to help here? Or if topics were surfacing. So basically it allowed me as a manager to have visibility into my teams to really help them perform and, and work better. Then when I left Sophos, uh, I had a bunch of people asking me, well, Dave, where's that script you had to tell us where the, what people talked about? And I thought, well, that wasn't my computer. It was just like a little Python script. And we started talking to companies and people. And first of all, people are frustrated by having too many meetings. There's just too many meetings. And what's funny is if you look at meetings in person in an office, they're, they're, they're very useful. I find them very useful, not for the meeting moment, but when you leave a meeting, you go out in the hall or to the kitchen and you talk about a meeting to someone else. And you're, the ideas kind of cross pollinate and, and, Innovation comes out of this, you know, companies grow from this. But what we did is we moved all the meetings online. So now what happens, we have none of the benefits of cross-pollination and overhearing things and whatnot. What we have is like a window into your company. So you give an update to your manager or to someone else. And then the moment the meeting is over, boop, you're disconnected from your company. And this, this, this doesn't only happen to people who are remotely located. It's also for, uh, for any team that's remotely located. So we built, we built a product that addressed this. We figured, okay, first of all, there's too many meetings. I don't know what's happening in the companies. I don't know what's happening across the organization. And frankly, I don't want to take, you know, I, I can't share my minutes. I can't read their minutes. I don't know what they're doing. So we built a product that organizes all your meetings in one place. It automatically summarizes and breaks down your, your meetings. So we take your video, your recording, your notes, whatever. We generate a, a basically minutes automatically. And uh, we make it searchable like Google. 
And frankly, I use, I use our own product with my WhatsApp voice notes and I put them in there so I can search for addresses and other information that people send me. But yeah, if effectively what we've built is a central library for all your meetings, regardless of the technology you're using, we, be it Zoom, Google Meets, Teams, whatever, uh, easily searchable through all your organization. So if you wanna know financial updates or customer problems, you can see what other teams are talking about, which is something that's really hard when you're working remotely. You have no visibility into what's happening across. And then, yeah, it's, it's automated, uh, like automating the whole minute creation. And then, you know, meetings are no longer a point in time. We allow people to contribute on the meeting after the meetings have happened. So you can comment, you can have a section of the meeting that you say, okay, you, a bit like Notion or any, any threads of comments. Um, but yeah, yeah, so it's a central library, searchable meetings and, and automated, automated minutes. Very good. Listen, we, we connected there last year um, to talk about like a, a remote management and, you know, you, you've got some it's really um, nice and interesting definition around what it means to be a flexible manager and <laughs> this concept that you have of everything smaller. But yeah. I think uh, segues nicely from. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, uh, <laughs> working remotely, again, I, I don't think. So in an office, we, we tried to take the meetings and move in online as is without changing anything. And I think that doesn't work when you're trying to manage people remotely, when you're trying, not even manage, when you're a person in a team, that doesn't fucking work. Okay, so my, my opinion, because I've been working as a remote worker for best part of 10 years, 15 years almost at this point, is that everything has to be smaller and it doesn't need to be, like it doesn't need to happen more. Like this whole culture of over communication to me is more of a culture of micromanagement because managers feel insecure when they, when they work online. So let's start with this. My meeting is usually never more than 10 minutes. Uh, the difference is there's always an agenda. There is material before. People who come to the meeting are expected to have looked at that content and that material. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. When I say never more than 10 minutes, that's not true. There are meetings where we just you know, shoot the shit and talk for hours for no reason. But typically it's 10 minutes, it's organized and it's concise. And if there are action items coming out of this, which there should be, then we can have more meetings after, but it's not about over communicating. It's about communicating slightly in a more slight, in a more efficient manner rather. But this, this is very tricky. A lot of, a lot, there's a lot of pushback on this in the companies. And, and Sophos that was infuriating to most of the other managers who basically spend their lives validating their positions as, as in meetings. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, everything, every, like, Continue with the questions. I don't even know where yeah, I am no, at this great, point. That's great, because that's the macro view there, actually. So Keith O'Neill has asked there, like, are there any, like, get, it segues nicely here as well, specific productivity tools that you cannot live with or without? Oh, absolutely. I cannot live now. I cannot live without ClearWord, but that's just a plug for my product. Yeah. But also Notion. Notion, from, day, from one day to the other, changed how I work. And... It annoys me that it's that I like it so much because I I, I spend on it. Um, everything else is pretty much disposable for me. How do you actually use Notion then? Uh, like, uh, is it a repository uh, for sharing across the teams, or like exactly what's your use case? Because it, yeah, it's a yeah, tool. I use it for many things actually. Mm -hmm. So we have obviously information, so it's kind of a wiki. We have a little backend integration for ClearWord. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I do like Slack as well. <laughs> <laughs> but Slack causes a lot of noise for me. But anyway, so for Notion, we have a little backend tool in ClearWord where our summaries or minutes that are generated are also added into Notion, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we use it for everything from, from uh, there, there's a section where we mainly discuss things. So we, we put topics and crazy ideas and we just have conversations about this there. So it's kind of in between Slack and email. It's not fully synchronous. It's a bit more rich. And there's a bit more information. Then there's straight up flat, boring, wiki-like information. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I also share pages in Notion that I export. Like you can share them to the web and I send them to people. That's mm -hmm. super useful. I don't need to put a website together. I just put my documentation, send it over to some advisors, to some friends. Give me your feedback on this. Uh, I, use, I use, yeah, geez, everything. Everything from the, the databases that they have, the lists, the... The, like the, the whole block system of 
it's like Lego blocks for mm. for for work for adults. It's awesome. I love it. Was the API was it just this week? Yeah. 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 Right. It's been you open know, for a bit in private beta, but yeah. this week they announced it fully open. Do you use Zettelkasten methods at all yourself? I don't even know what it is. Okay, Grant, we'll move on. So, uh, John <laughs> Fleming says uh, you operate operationalize everything you do. How do you get into that mindset? <laughs> I I don't know. I think <laughs> for me for me it's it's natural, and it's not only just operation operationalizing. It's it's I really like my brain works this way. Things have to be organized. Mm -hmm. Things have to be prioritized, and things have to be executed on. Uh, if you are a psychologist, you will say that's one of my, my, my problems. I'm very competitive. Like if I don't compete in, then I, I don't like what I'm doing. Mm. In the case, th this ties to me into operationalizing everything where I come up with a process for everything. And I think that's just how my brain works, to be honest. Uh, I've over the years, I've, I've spent an incredible amount of time learning how to not to do things i guess that's what that's what we would yeah. go with like prioritizing yeah. to me is not figuring out what's important to do it's figuring out what i'm not going to do sacrificing things that are important for other things uh prior prioritizing is is the greatest skill that i've learned and it's over years and years and mistakes and people hating me about it um well it's been said many times it's a superpower for any founder uh, any startup right as a prioritization i i yeah but then it spills over in my life also yeah, and yeah, everything yeah. I do is prioritized. And sometimes it seems cold the way I respond to people, the way I do things. Mm -hmm. But to me, that, that's part of operationalizing my life. I mean, I, I keep track of you know, the times I go to sleep. I keep track of everything I do and I try to optimize it. And it's, it's all about time. And that's the only resource that I cannot raise more of or get more of is time for me and, and air technically, but I have okay. to optimize my time. So knowing that that's your personality, right? And you're, you're, you've been part of many founding teams, right? You know, uh, yeah. different personalities that, you know, always come into found, founding teams, you're looking for complimentary people, et cetera. But can you tell us a little bit about how your founding teams, you know, came about, you know? There's a few <laughs> stories there, I think. Oh, there's, there's a lot of stories, actually. There's more than two. So we'll start with Eamon Leonard and Echo Libre. Eamon Leonard, I was speaking at a conference in Dublin and we had a common friend from Germany, Jan Lenhard, who said, you two need to meet. And I was just speaking about whatever, open source or PHP or something. And in between the talks, I sat down at the pub, met Emo, and halfway through the pint, he said, do you want to start a business with me? And in this case, it really wasn't about fixing a problem, but I knew I wanted to do more with that person. Mm. So it wasn't about wanting to start a business. It, it was about wanting to, like, somehow immediately I knew that this was going to change my life to work with that person. Mm. And it did not only, not only professionally, but personally, he's, he's taught me a lot. Um, so I guess the first part of this is then it, it's all about the person, uh, you know, like the founding team is all about the people you work with, yeah. not only friends, but people that are complementary. and not saying people that are the same yeah. because that just causes problems to be honest and never my friends, almost never my friends. Mm -hmm. But there, there's many other ways. Uh, for Barricade, for instance, Barricade was a problem. A, a problem when I left Engineer, I'd been working in the security side for a while. I started building the product. And, and now here is where my secret for co-founders come in. Uh, and then I reached out to one of my mentor back then. And he said, talk to that person. So I reached out to Dara Irwin. And Dara had no background in security. He was not a deep tech person like me. He was a designer. He's a product person. He's, a, he's, he's deep into psychology. And he was really good at arguing with me the moment I met him. <laughs> and I like that. I like, like, it's very important for me because I'm not good at what's happening today. Mm. And, and I can see, like, I don't know if I'm wearing pants now, but I know that in three years time, I'm going to be wearing orange shoes kind of thing. Mm. And the moment I met Dara, I was thinking, huh, yeah, I can argue with him. I like this. And I brought him not in Barricade because of his security background, but because he had no security background and could provide a new fresh perspective without the bias that we all have in the security industry. Same thing for Cloda, which was my CFO. For her, it was straight up. She works hard. She's loyal. And I want to work with her. 
So I, I think founding the team, like right now, the, for Clearword, I'm bringing Cloda, Dara, Ross, and I'm trying to bring most of the team back together. But it's okay. about the people, it's about their loyalty, and it's about being able to call me on my bullshit, which is super important. Okay, brilliant. Okay, excellent. Listen, I'm going to move on to um, your plans, hopes, and expectations for Clearword in the next 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. So for, for Clearword, we're kind of starting to raise, I think. Like, I, don't, I didn't want to raise because I don't need to right now. Uh, yeah. But as I said, it's easier to raise on a story. And I have a really fucking good story. And people are, are seem interested right now. There's a lot of volatility in the financial markets, which brings a lot of money into the higher risk venture market, which is awesome. Uh, so there's a lot of capital available for startups. So our plan is to raise probably two or three million as a seed mm -hmm. and then really, really go very hard at building a team in deep tech. So for us, like we, we have, we say AI, we have actual machine learning behind the scenes, some very advanced models. Uh, we want to operationalize this and make it scalable at, at scale to really have more. So it's, it's hiring a team of deep tech people, but then also sales, hiring salespeople to find, well, initially it's to find the market fit and hiring a team that will find the market fit and really work on it. And then it's just exploding the sales. Because it's, it's easy for me to, tech is easy. It's easy for me to go into my code and, and this is safe and this is where I control every little variable and it's, it's beautiful. But in the next 18 months is bring the money in from either investors, market fits, and then grow the sales team. And when we joined Sophos, like for me, as a tech nerd, the sales is hard. But when I joined Sophos, that was specifically my goal was to learn how a big organization builds a sales engine. Mm. And in this case, it's a distribution first channel and what i've seen all they do and they they invest so much time and energy into training their salespeople. and when i left sophos i was like in sophos it's funny because when you're a salesperson you go through through levels and certifications basically and the ceo is the only one who had gold or whatever black or the name of that certificate but since i wasn't doing anything i was basically resting investing i decided to start doing all of them so apart from the ceo only me had the black certificate. So I've learned everything they do and I've understood how to build their sales distribution channels. And that, that's just what I want to build now. Actually, it's, it's super fascinating once you remove the, you know, the, the traveling salesman kind of idea yeah. of sales and you look at problems that you're actually approaching. It's super complicated. Humans are so hard. Oh my God, that's amazing. Listen, so we're, we're, I'm conscious of the time. I'm going to run through a few like rapid fire questions with you. Yep. <clears throat> Just pass on any one, one that you can't answer quickly. Right. And okay. we can mark and... it for another time. Sounds... So Twitter, tell us about your relationship with Twitter. Don't use it. Done with this. People so selling pretty, to people. Yeah. Pretty serious snowboarder and surfer. What do you love about boarding? Everything. I love the mountain. I love the risk. I love the uncertainty. I love the unknown. I love the health benefits. I love the, the, the loneliness. I love the freedom. Oh, sounds uh, poetic. Uh, you have a natural talent for maths, but the way it's taught is not really at the odds of the way you learn. What, what, what would you change about that if you could wave a magic wand? Take people outside. Teach maths as a language, not as a discipline. You have a deep interest in evolutionary game theory. Is there any insights from, from, from this field that you apply <laughs> in your everyday life? Uh, yeah, again, that's how my brain works. Uh, game theory is all about backwards induction. So you start from the end of this, the, the, the outcomes and you figure out what happened. My brain works this way. So I see strategies and I start from the bottom uh, up. Uh, so yeah, I do. Very good. Music, audiobooks, podcasts. Is there any that you've recommended to a friend recently? Uh, yeah, yeah. I've recommended uh, David McWilliams' podcast, big fan. Uh, anything from uh, Nassim Taleb. I, I kind of like it. It's a bit pontificating, but I like it. Very good. And a hat tip to Tim Ferriss here is what's the most impactful purchase you have made of an item that cost 100 euro or less? Bullshit. Never even crossed my mind. <laughs> uh, overrated or underrated? Pulled pork. Rated. Underrated. There. Underrated. Distributed teams. Underrated. The Winkelfoss twins. Greatly overrated. Bootstrapping. Underrated and overrated. Yeah. City center office space. Overrated. Bidenomics. Underrated. 
Mm. And annoyingly, it, it affects me greatly, but it's underrated. <laughs> yeah. French fries, cheese curds, and gravy. Oh, cruf. overrated. <laughs> NFTs. <laughs> the, what's what's above overrated? <laughs> So I got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's season four of The Sons of Anarchy. Overrated or underrated? Uh, slightly overrated. Two Having, more. Yeah. yeah. The expectation that Bitcoin will exceed 100,000 in 2021. Ah, as a as a very as a crypto nerd, greatly underrated. Yes. <laughs> and finally, avocado toast. Love it. Underrated. <laughs> very good super overrated okay. <laughs> so thanks very much for that well done um, so we're, we're about to go into our breakout rooms to meet other founders on their journey um, to, so we can share our experiences and lessons learned and each room will have a facilitator and we'll be back here at 12 for Q&A with David if, uh, any follow up questions there for David haven't had the discussion um, Pop them into the chat there, and we'll. Uh, I, I'll ask you, read it, ask you to unmute, and ask uh, David directly. Well, when I'm looking at all those those comments, actually, it's it's funny because this is exactly the problem we're addressing at Clearword. It's everyone <laughs> who says, "Oh, sorry, I have to pop up. Sorry, I have to pop off, and sorry, I have to go somewhere else." It's very <laughs> interesting because that's the whole idea of working remotely. Sometimes distractions are vastly different than in an office, and you have to leave. And you miss parts of it. What if you didn't have to miss any part? Anyways, so I so find I'm going to call on Luke there. Luke Murphy, could you just unmute there and ask David your question? Yeah, no problem. Hi, David. How's it going? And um, so, yeah, so my question is, um, how do you collect and summarize uh, customer interview insights? Um, and if you do that with Notion, what's the best way to do that? <laughs> so there's only... Like right now, the customer insights that I'm interested in are, that's going to sound very stupid, but it's not what they like. It's really their objections. So one thing I've learned at Sophos is training objection re rebuttal is incredibly valuable for your sales teams. So right now in Notion, we have basically a big table database that contains objections. Um, it's, it's the questions they ask how, like sometimes I can't rebut, I can't, I don't have an answer. And that is also fine. But for us, it's customer calls, customer emails, customer discussions, anything in the park, online, anywhere. It's about the objections for me. Anything else at this stage for clear word again, it, like I've done it multiple times and I still don't know what I'm doing, to be honest with you. I have no fucking clue what I'm doing. So right now, all I'm trying to do is figure out what people dislike, what's worrying them, and how I can address those questions. Because when they tell you what they, what, what's blocking them, <laughs> that means your messaging is shit and you have to address this. And once you, like what we've started noticing is if more people, like one of the questions that came up initially it, right away was, uh, do I have to use a new, new video tool for ClearWord? Do I have to switch to ClearWord? I was like, no, 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 just you can use Teams, Zoom, whatever. It doesn't matter your technology. We just add value to your data. Then it started coming up and over and over again. Then we realized, oh, well, that's like initially the, the normal reaction is oh, people just don't get it. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, wait, 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 people do get it we are being dumb here. That came from the objections. Objections are super, super important because they give you a very critical look at you and your business and your messaging. And that's literally all I track right now. And then there's obviously levels of interest and the normal sales pipeline from qualified leads and all that sort of stuff. But at our level in this moment, it's, it's all objections. And I will continue doing this throughout the life of, of the company through IPO. I don't care what level of the company is. Sophos had a huge database of objections. So if you have any word related to an objection from a customer, you could search it. You could have the reviews of it. So for instance, for us in ClearWord, I also put the, the meetings with objections in, in the objections theme, and we can go back to see them. But it's all objections for me. And in Notion, it's just a big table. I put the date, the link to our ClearWord meeting, the link to the email, copy something, screenshots, anything I have, but it's all about the objections and the solution and the answer you have to give to this. Then your message is, is on point. It's always the same and it's, it's clear. That's great, thanks very much. Very good, thanks, great question. Uh, Ian Jones, would you unmute? Thanks, uh, hi David, thank you very much for your time. Uh, so a lot of people in the room got a lot from your conversations, uh, mainly all starters uh, or founders starting up. Who's the first hire 
when do you make it and why do you make it well first of all immediately and it's funny because it's not about the tech it's not about the product it's about being complementary so i'm deep tech i will not hire someone who's deep tech because he's my friend or she's my friend it's really figuring out as a person as a founder what you're really shit at and finding someone who isn't shit at this and also someone who you are willing to spend an incredible amount of time with. And it's okay to argue. Arguing is super, super important. Uh, but for me, it's, it's someone who will catch the things I'm bad at. So it takes quite a bit of introspection. For me, it took failures. It took introspection. It took time to figure out what I'm not good at. But once you accept this and you stop craving validation of other people on the things that you need, you say, okay, I'm not good at these things. And then you meet people and you say, are they good at that? For instance, Cloda here, she, she runs, I, I could not run a business without her anymore. She runs the day-to-day -day for everything finance and everything because I can't, I honestly, I can't do it. So that would be my answer. That's a complimentary great. person. That's a great segue into, thanks Ian, uh, to Fanula O'Callaghan from RDI Hub. If you're there, could you share your question? I sure am. Um, just a second now, no one type find my actual question. Oh yeah, okay. So your background is in tech, but how were you able to jump the mindset to the customer needs? <laughs> because I've always been selling things. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I grew up with a mom who was very entrepreneurial and I've always sold things. Uh, I, I sold you know, DVD rips and in school I was selling basically anything I could find and I, I kind of like the human interaction of selling. I, I like the, the, it's almost gambling and it's stressful and it's awkward. And yeah, it's not a jump for me as much as it's like, it's kind of a lifestyle. I like haggling with people. I, I find it fun. I find it interesting. And being rejected is not a problem I have. And for me, it's very different than most people. Uh, but for people who are not used to selling, I think before, so sales is all about rejection. It's all about being able to handle rejection on a personal level. And I'm a big fan of the 100 day rejection experiment. So if you, if you, go, if you don't know about it, Google it, find a, it's called the 100 day rejection experiment. And it's just some lad going around doing crazy asks to people. Like he goes to, let's say Burger King and he says, can you put four burgers and a, a pound of sauce or whatever? And, and people do it. You, you realize that, first of all, being rejected is okay because frankly, no one cares about your problems and what you're asking. But once you learn how to deal with the rejection, then the selling becomes kind of natural, I think. Like for me, I don't mind if I look like an idiot, but this unlocks me for, for, for a lot of stuff when it comes to selling. Because then I'm not shy about someone saying, nah, that's stupid. So yeah, I'd say it's not a jump as much as it's a, it's a mindset change. So the, the hundred day experiment is, is something I, I, I give to all the companies I've worked with who struggle at selling. Oh, very good. Thank you. Thanks, Vanilla. So it initially attracts me to snowboarding. I don't mind looking like an idiot. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I don't mind. That's why the difference is the same thing. I jump a 10 meter cliff. I will most likely pelt myself yeah. and that's okay. And that is totally okay. Yeah. So you just have to have more risky things in order to stay in that zone where, you know, you've got the yeah. risk. <laughs> okay, uh, Patricia Kelpie. Thank you so much for your inspiration this morning. Here's a quick question. What bit of advice would you give us when we're pitching and only have three minutes to tell the story and make the ask? <laughs> uh, don't. <laughs> Like if, if you only have three minutes to pitch, then find someone else to pitch to. <laughs> no, it's fine. Look, refine, refine your message. One of my mentor said, you have to pitch yourself in 60 seconds. He said, write it down and repeat your speech. Listen to yourself, record yourself. And if it's more than a minute, you won't be able to tell anyone what you're doing or about yourself. So what I started doing is I did record myself and I hated my voice. I still do, by the way. And he said, okay, now remove all the hums and remove all the, the interjections that are useless and focus on what you want to do in one minute. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. Like sometimes if it's just three minutes, nail your pitch, that's all. What's your problem? What's your solution? That is all. 
and your ask is pretty simple. Most people are scared of asking. This comes down to the same thing as selling. It's the rejection problem. I have no problem bold face to someone saying I'm raising 12 million euro at a valuation of 100 billion. And they say, wow, how did you come up with that valuation? Like every other startup, I made it up. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The idea is confidence and not being scared of being rejected, but just nail your, your problem, your, your, your solution. And if you have more time than in your three minutes after recording yourself, then explain why now and why you, and then ask, just ask. And it's, it's okay after three minutes to say, look, I, I want to follow up on this. Reach out to me. Be bold and ask. It's transformative. Yeah, that's great. Fantastic. Fintan Kennedy. Hi. Uh, thanks, David. And uh, I love your, uh, the way you embrace vulnerability and go for failures and, and learn from them. And just when you talked before, you talked about your golden folder when you set up a business and Ooh, yeah. getting it ready for for a deal straight away. How do you structure that from, and I'm sure there's been, they haven't all been successes. Oh no, there's many non-successes. Uh, so the golden folder for me is very important uh, because it's the one true source. It's, it's like the, your, your, what's the word? It's your golden source of truth if you want. And it just saves you time in the long run, but it also saves you time for normal admin tasks. Okay. So the golden fo folder for us as different subfolders, there is financial problem or financial problems. Yeah, sorry, startups. There is financial folders. There's uh, research and development folders. There's employee folders, contracts, all that sort of stuff. I mean, I think it is still relevant. I am always prepared for an acquisition, but I never seek out for an acquisition. I've, I've never once sent an email saying, hey, do you guys want to buy us? Really, like I, I, every single startup that I've heard that started saying, ah, yeah, they're going to acquire us has failed. So if you start with the end already planned into an acquisition, you're not trying to solve a problem. You're trying to get out of a problem before you started. So for me, yes, the golden folder is relevant because I've gone through it. I've gone through many times where I don't have it. And it's, it, it, frankly, it sucks. And it takes months and lawyer works and, and a lot of problems. But for most people, I would say you don't need it yet. Just just focus on your business, focus on your problem. Don't try to, to take shortcuts to leave because startups are all about shortcuts and that is VC and that is investment pushed usually. Same for bootstrap. Bootstrap, you have no money. You're trying to get somewhere. You take shortcuts. The golden folder is a shortcut that I usually don't take. I didn't start one now for clear word yet. We didn't start one yet, but eventually we will. And, and, and I don't plan on selling clear word. I probably will based on my track record, unfortunately, but I don't plan on, to, on, on selling it. So I don't know if that answers your question or if it just creates more questions. But Yeah, it does. No, it was just, it was more the learning from the other ones from the previous that you... Okay, so then, yes, going through previous acquisitions, not having it was a pain in the ass. Having it was still a pain in the ass because acquisitions are terrible processes to go through. But if you have some of your ducks in a row, then it's, it's slightly less painful. Let's go with that. Cool, thank you. Great, um, so Alan Boyle has a question. I know that I asked you myself of late. I'm sure it's in many other people's minds. Mm -hmm. David, thanks a lot. A very operationally efficient talk, enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> but in terms of the way you manage your time to a T, mm -hmm. eight hours sleep, overrated, underrated, why? Very, well, it depends for people. So it's, it's extremely subjective, right? Uh, for me, since I'm a kid, more than four is, affects my day-to-day. My, my -day. I, can't, I can't work. If I have more than four hours sleep, I'm inefficient. So instead I've optimized my time for this. So I sleep four hours and I have one or two power naps during the day. But that's since I'm like two, three years old. My daughter is the same thing. She, I, I walk up in the middle of the night, walk around her room and she's like this. <laughs> so eight hours sleep right now, I'm trying to do it because I'm working on losing weight and I understand the biochemistry of it and it's useful, but look, sleep, it's, a, it's about your balance. <laughs> Like I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you to sleep 10 hours. I'm not going to sleep you to tell you to sleep two hours. That's, that's what people in San Francisco do. They, they pontificate and they try to give you new lifestyles and tell you to fast. And then they tell you to stop fasting. And they tell you to sleep more, sleep less. I, I think it's just, it has to be a bit, a bit more chilled. Figure out what works for you. If you have kids, if you don't have kids, if, if you live, if you need to sleep, if you don't, it doesn't matter. 
Sorry. <laughs> no, that's excellent. Excellent. Um, so uh, one final uh, person to come online, Martina Fitzgerald. She had a, obviously a very active room there. Lots of questions coming out of that. If you could come on, Martina, and uh, represent the room, that'd be great. All right. And I do. We have a lot of questions. Owen Ferris wants to know if David tells adv his advice, tells when he's doing a pitch, do, do you say that you're lazy? Do you Absolutely. Be First thing. <laughs> really? Honestly? <laughs> uh, 100 percent. I will send you recordings that shows immediately. I tell them, look, we build this because I'm lazy. Okay. I want. Uh, but really, it's not laziness. It's, it's really an obsession for efficiency. But yeah. OK, Kirsten Kraus has joined us from South Africa. He asked us to to ask you about his, your mistakes along the way, that it can't be that easy. So basically, <laughs> I think you hit on that, um, that uh, how many failures you have, basically. Oh, in dollars or in business numbers? Um, let's go with failures from, first of all, not confusing product fit with product market fit, uh, confusing champions in a company when you're trying to sell and finding market fit uh, to, to confusing the champions with promoters uh, or with, with early adopters, if you want. Uh, I've, I've yeah, burned through investor money in months because of the, let's say, strong disagreement with founders and bad directions. I've wasted time. I still waste time sometimes. Everyone wastes time. Uh, wastes time. Um, what else? I mean, there's so many fucking failures. I don't even know where to start. Uh, once I was trying to sell a company, but I had shared intellectual property with another company I owned that caused a massive amount of problems during the acquisition. Uh, that's why I say I have 3.5 acquisition under my belt because they had to buy the two companies, which that caused a whole set of problems, which did not have a golden folder either, clearly, because the IP was shared in two companies. Uh, what else is there? I've also been on the side where I have the IP, which is great. I'm the only one who made money in some cases because the company crashed after they needed the IP and they didn't want to pay me for it. In hindsight, that was not a very good thing to do. But I, I did keep my IP for myself and the patents. Um, yeah, I mean, it, professional mistakes. I was working as a consultant when I was about 19 and people realize I'm really good at being direct and blunt. So the consultancy firm that I was working for, which was a hedge fund, uh, started sending me in to fire people. So I would go into companies they invested in. Eventually I wasn't writing software anymore. I was firing people. So I would go in a company, not know anyone. Everyone's like 30, 40, 30, 40, 50 years old. They have families. And at that point I was just making a ton of money and I would walk in, you know, optimize their process and fire half the company, so, you know, slim down. This, personally, not something I'm too proud about. I would not do that again. Um, so that, that's, that's personal failures that you learn from. Uh, failures personal also, there's not investing enough time in myself during previous startups. I mean, startups are massive sacrifice. So if you don't learn how to balance your life, it caused a divorce. It caused my daughter to call me FaceTime because I was gone for four months when she was born. Uh, there, there's plenty of really big personal, professional, and, 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 and life failures, I think, through the process. I don't know where to start. There's too many. Um, there, are three, there are three more. And I, Liam, I, or Niall, I don't know if you want I'm to. Actually, yeah, no, I'm very conscious of the time here. So um, actually, what we're going to do is we're gonna, I'm going to thank you all for all your questions. I really enjoyed all the questions here in this, uh, this final session. And I want to thank David for being so generous with his time. And I want to hand over to Radine now for the final wrap. Shoot me an email. I can jump on any call anytime, anyone. Thanks, Great. David. Thank on you. On that, Martina, what we might do is, will you send me those questions and David, I'll share them with you. It's probably the easiest thing. Um, if you're happy to, to answer them and we'll get back to everybody. Um, so thanks everybody. Andy's going to just share a quick QR code there to get some feedback. We're a startup, we're figuring it out. Tell us where you're stuck, where, where you need help and, and we'll mold and change the founder circle to, to uh, help move the dial for you. A uh, couple of dates for your diaries. The next founder circle is going to be a founder's weekend takeover. So that's the first weekend in July. It's two days. You join the session if you're a founder who wants to perfect a pitch, if you're looking to expand your team or find a co-founder and a founder who, um, who wants to spend intense time doing like customer validation. So just some downtime. You get to meet and, and get mentoring from some of the most successful entrepreneurs in our ecosystem which is um something i'm really looking forward to so that's the first weekend in july i'll send around something after uh with a link to that um 
to our facilitators today, to all the founders who joined us, a huge thank you. But again, just saying what Niall was saying, a huge thank you to David, um, because you were really open and honest. And I think especially towards the end there, you were talking about the sacrifices. We don't talk about them enough sometimes. Um, so to get under the hood of your how your mind works uh, and how you embrace rejection was really, really, uh, I'll be thinking about it for a while. Um, so it was lovely meeting you and seeing everyone today. We'll see you all again, the Founder Circle in July. And thank you to everybody.